The original Super Mario RPG is one of my favorite games of all time, and the recently released remake for Nintendo Switch blew my expectations out of the water. Not just because it's super well made as a remake, but also because they didn't remove any of the charm. And by that I of course mean all the fun little missable secrets. In case you're not aware, this game has a lot of secrets. Too many to count. Secrets upon secrets upon secrets upon secrets. For example, did you know you can enter a code in the pause menu that makes Toad pop up and check your stats and other stuff? Or that there's a hidden item that has a different animation only if Peach uses it? Or that there's a secret unlockable 2D bullet hell shooter which changes background depending on your party member orientation? Yeah, I'm serious. This game has countless cool things you'd never even see if you just play through the story. So in this video, I'm going to go over every little fun fact that I know. Anyways, if you like this type of content, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, since this is kind of just what I do. And let's make a bet that if you already know a lot about this game, but still learn something new by the end, you have to leave a like on this video. And if you don't learn something new, you can dislike it. I'm that confident. I'm going to be covering these fun facts loosely in order that they become available. That way, if you want to try these for yourself, you will know when you'll be able to. And also, you can just click off the video if you don't want any further spoilers. With that all said and done, let's start with that pause menu secret code I mentioned earlier. At any point of the game, if you open your pause menu and then on your controller input down, up, right, left, L, R, L, R, B in that order, Toad will pop up and say, you found a secret code. I wonder what it did. Let's check your stats. After this, he actually checks your stats and says, huh, looks like nothing changed. Well, maybe it gave you some experience. Then he walks over to your experience points and says, nope, that's still the same too. I'll level with you. There aren't any other secret codes. And this one will do the same thing every time. Though I'm always happy to hang out if you want to try again. That's all for the secret code. And then he runs off. This actually was in the original, but only in the Japanese version. The code was removed from all international releases. So it's really cool that they brought it back and fully translated it in the game. I did try this the moment I was able to pause, but it didn't work. And that's because they changed the input for it. So I thought it was just not brought back, until I saw an article about it later. Next up, here's something that sounds like it would be fake, but it's not. Normally when you jump on one of the safe blocks, Mario shoots up and he becomes the cursor that you select a safe file with. And after you click yes when the game asks you if you want to override the current safe data, he does a little hat tipping animation. Cute. But here's the part that sounds fake. If you say no to overriding the safe data 10 times and then say yes afterwards, he does this little slumping pose instead of the hat tipping one. Weird. And going even further, if you say no 11 times and then yes, he does his funny little X or imitation pose instead. The way it works that is for every even number of times you say no before saying yes, he'll do the slump pose, and for every odd number of no's, he'll do the X or pose, and it starts at 10. Moving away from menu stuff for now, let's go over a couple fun hidden animations that are so small, talking about them won't take long. On the way to the Mushroom Kingdom, there are these spinning flowers that you're supposed to stand on and then jump off to gain a lot of distance, but if you stay on them for a while longer without jumping off, this happens. Similarly, once you get to the kingdom, there's this toad child running in circles, or squares, really fast, and if you can manage to jump on his head, because you can just stand on any NPC you want, this will eventually happen. Poor Mario, but we're not done yet. If you go into the item shop and jump onto the pantry behind the owner, Mario will spin around and tip his hat in pride. But the owner gets mad and tells you to get down, which Mario, being the good fella he is, obviously does. Though after this, you can just jump on it again and then the owner doesn't really care. Alright, now this one's super iconic. If you go into Peach's bedroom in the castle and then check in this corner by the fireplace, you'll get a text box saying, found Peach's question mark, question mark, question mark. And then her grandma interrupts to ask what you think you're doing. Then she runs over to you and says, I'll give you this in exchange. Just leave everything where it was. And then she gives you a mushroom. If you instead do this by the time Peach joined your party, she'll say, Mario, comes out angrily, stop peeking into other people's rooms. Now, in case it's not obvious what this question mark, question mark, question mark thing is, in the original Japanese translation, it instead said you found her XXX. Meaning it's either a bottle of alcohol, since in cartoons those are typically marked with three X's, or, more likely, it's a, uh, uh, it's a sex toy, you, you know what it is. I don't know why she's so okay with her grandma knowing about it, but, you know, whatever, at least you get a funny little interaction out of it. Also, if you're curious as to why there's a second Peach in her room, she actually joins your party in secret, so if you go back into her room afterwards, Granny is disguising as the real one. What a goat. 
All right, rewinding back to the start of the game again. After defeating Croco together with Mallow for stealing stuff, he'll drop a wallet and Mario decides to pick it up. Once you get back to the Mushroom Kingdom, it's overtaken by some shysters, and this toad is running from one. If you defeat it, he thanks you for saving him, and he notices that you have his wallet on you that was stolen by Croco. He asks if he can have it back, and if you say sure, he gives you a flower tab as thanks. Now that's all well and good, but where's the fun in being a decent person, am I right? Instead of this, you can also sell the wallet in the store for a whopping 123 coins. Its description even says it's a fat wallet. If you do this and then go save the toad, he thanks you for saving him as usual, and if you talk to him again, he just remarks that his wallet is gone. Gee, I wonder where it is. But what you can also do instead is say no to giving his wallet back after you save him, then go into the store and sell it, and then go talk to the toad again. He'll say, hey, give me back my wallet, and if you say alright, quit whining, he'll get mad that you gave it to someone else and says that you're gonna get it. Twice. Dang, Mario is crazy. Speaking of which, fast forwarding a bit, when you finally catch up to Bowyer in the forest maze who's been shooting stun arrows at the people of Rose Town, Mallow says to Mario that they've got to do something, to which Mario just starts wanting to throw hands with them. Mallow stops Mario and says, who do you think you are? You can't just go in there with your fist flying. The reason I bring this up is because of something they removed. In the original, Mallow actually said, who do you think you are, Bruce Lee? In reference to the real life professional martial artist and actor, Bruce Lee. Mallow's sentence obviously still works in the remake, but it's a bit of a shame they removed the reference. Maybe they were afraid of running into some kind of legal term or something, so I understand the removal. Something similar happened with the next boss, Punchinello. In the original, at the start of his fight, he'd say, Good day, the name's Nello, Punchinello, as a reference to James Bond's iconic introduction of saying, The name's Bond, James Bond. This was his introduction because the English localizer of Super Mario RPG originally wanted this boss's name to be James Bomb, a not-so-subtle reference to James Bond's name. But the higher-ups wouldn't allow it for legal reasons, so he just settled on the sly, the name's Nello, Punchinello line. But in the remake, this reference was removed, and now he instead says, Good day, the name's Punchinello, bomb maker extraordinaire. I understand removing the Bruce Lee line since that was just saying a real-life person's actual name, but I can't imagine they would get in any legal trouble for keeping the Nello, Punchinello line, since that's actually a loose reference and not quoting something verbatim. I don't know, I'm not a legal professional, but I feel like they could have kept this in. Getting back to things actually in the remake, once you've defeated Boyer and Gino joins your party, if you go back to the Rose Town Inn, where Gas lives, the kid who originally owns the Gino doll, you can see a cool cutscene that is easily missable. It involves the gang explaining to Gas that Gino has to travel with Mario to restore the Star Road, otherwise wishes can't come true anymore. And it even has Mario wanting to punch Gas for saying Mario needs all the help he can get, referencing how Gas knocked Mario out cold when playing with dolls earlier. Dang Mario, calm down. This technically isn't useless since you get a free weapon for Gino out of it, which is nice, but what is useless is that from this point onwards, if you decide to spend the night at the inn, when you wake up, Link from the Legend of Zelda series will be sleeping in the bed next to you, and when you try interacting with him, it'll play the classic Puzzle Solve jingle from his home series. If you do this, an entry gets added in the all-new scrapbook journal called The Slumbering Hero, in which Mallow writes, Someone heroic looking was sleeping in the Rose Town Inn. I bet he's tired from his legends or adventures, but I'd like to link up with him and chat over a tadpole cola. Wow, that's just filled with all the references, isn't it? Legends, as in Legend of Zelda. Adventures might be a reference to Link's adventure. Link up, as in Link's name. And Mallow saying he'd like to chat with him might be pointing fun at the fact that Link is a silent protagonist. I'm surprised he didn't write something about how he's probably dreaming about giant magical fish in the sky. Shortly after this, you go through Pipe Way, where if you get flattened by this Twomp, Mario will actually literally get flattened and then slide down the stairs. That's pretty funny. Through here, you can find a secret path to Yoster Isle, where you can partake in Yoshi races to win some cookies. You can only hold 20 cookies at a time though, so if you win an amount that would put you over more than 20, this red Yoshi will say he'll store the excess cookies for you, and he promises you that he won't eat any of them. But this red Yoshi has a cookie hold limit of his own. He can only store 200. So if you go over that, he will say that he'll store whatever he can, but that he might nibble on the rest, breaking his promise. And to add insult to injury, he'll also say that they were mighty tasty. Thanks, bro. I mean, to be fair, you really never need to get more than 200 cookies. They can have them for all I care. After this, you go through the whole molefill arc, and I already went over the change with Punchinello's introduction here. But you can also run into one of the bombs he throws before the fight, which just kinda stuns Mario and makes him shake his head. 
yeah, these explosives don't do much, huh? The minecart segment after this has some pretty basic controls. You got buttons for brake, jump, and accelerate, as well as the control stick to change tracks, obviously. But there's actually a hidden function here that the game doesn't tell you about. And that is that if you press one of these shoulder buttons, you will honk the cart's horn. This is pretty funny on its own, especially when you consider that mining carts typically don't have horns, at least not to my knowledge. One other thing I really want to mention about this easter egg is that it was also possible to do in the original version. And here it's extra funny because it's one of only two functions those shoulder buttons have in the entire game. The other one also being an easter egg that lets you change the direction the pack scrolls in the pause menu by holding down both shoulder buttons and pressing a direction on the d-pad. Which, you know, is still useless. Yeah, there's no other uses for them in the entire game. You can't even scroll through menu pages with them. You gotta do that with the d-pad. After the minecart segment, you meet three grey sniffits called Sniffster number 1, Sniffster number 2, and Sniffster number 3. And these guys are related to what is probably my favorite easter egg in the whole game. They're later revealed to be the three henchmen of this guy named Booster, who has a tower full of these sniffits as regular enemies. But they're all blue, with the exception of the three grey ones called Sniffsters I mentioned earlier. Well, in a secret pathway you can discover outside of Booster's Tower in Booster's Pass, you can find another one of these regular blue sniffits called Apprentice, who recognizes you as that famous Mario guy, and says that if he can beat you, they'll let him become Sniffster number 4, if he's lucky. After this, he fights you, and he is insanely weak. Like, so weak that the only way to lose this fight is to outright not attack him at all, and let him damage you over and over again. And even then, it can take an extremely long time. But why would you want to lose this fight, you might be asking? Well, if you do, you don't actually get a game over, and instead get a scene of him saying, Alright, now I'll be Sniffster number 4, after which he runs off super excited. Then, if you make it all the way up Booster's tower, he'll actually be there in front of Booster's room as Sniffster number 4. He's even a grey Sniffit now instead of the regular blue he was before. And if you talk to him, he says, After years of hard work and effort, I'm now Sniffster number 4. I'll wear the number proudly. And this would be an awesome easter egg on its own, but there's a lot more to it. If you go back to that secret path in Booster's Pass, there will be another blue Sniffit called Apprentice, who this time says that if he can beat you, they'll make him Sniffster number 5, if he's lucky. And sure enough, if you lose to him, he runs off and then appears at the top of Booster's Tower as Sniffster number 5, saying, Phew, I've been training to become one of Booster Sniffsters for 3 years. And it goes further still. You can go back to lose to another Sniffit Apprentice to make Sniffster number 6 that says, If only Ma and Pa could see me now. And yet another Sniffit Apprentice to make Sniffster number 7 that says, Yeehaw! Hurrah! I'm a Sniffster. I'm speechless. And here's the best part. After number 7, there's yet another Sniffit Apprentice that says he'll become Sniffster number 8 if he beats you. But if he does, you'll find him at the top of the tower, still in his blue outfit, looking out the window, saying, The boss only wants seven Sniffsters. All my training was in vain. What a rip. And talking to him again, he says, I'm off to the arcade. I just love that Booster wants specifically seven Sniffster henchmen and no more than that. Also, if you want to do this for yourself, I highly recommend letting yourself get roughed up by some other nearby enemies before engaging the Sniffit apprentices, since really it takes forever to lose to them. Anyways, despite getting all these extra Sniffsters, Booster is still only seen with three main ones wherever he goes, which makes sense. It's not really worth it to make seven different versions of all cutscenes with Booster in it, depending on how many Sniffsters you've recruited for him. There is another small fun detail about the supposed Sniffster number 8, but I'll talk about that when it becomes relevant, which is much later in the game. Also, did you know that for some reason you can fall off this path where you find the apprentice snippets to end back up in the previous room? Which is really weird as usually if you try to do so, you're stopped by an invisible wall, even in paths that look extremely similar to this one. I can think of one other place in the game where you can fall off the map, but there it's inherently tied to the gameplay, so it makes sense. Anyways, Booster's Tower is full of cool little details. I mean, it's meant to be kind of like a toy-like amusement park. Everyone already knows about the 8-bit Mario easter egg you can do once per save file, so I won't spend much time on it. And most people also already know about Booster's toy box in his room having some cameo dolls in it, namely one of Samus from Metroid, a car from Stunt Race FX, Rob the Robotic Operating Buddy, and Diskun, who is the mascot of the Famicom Disk System peripheral for the Famicom, which is basically the NES in Japan. 
But here's something that's not really new to the remake, but at the same time, it kind of is. In the lobby of Booster's Tower, there's a figurine of a seemingly random mech suit on the reception desk, which on closer inspection is actually the Magitech armor from Final Fantasy VI. This was always there, even in the original, but because of how small it was and it already being a 16-bit game, it was basically impossible to see what it is. But thanks to the remake being of much higher quality, we can finally see what this cool cameo was always meant to be. Anyways, going past Booster Tower, for now, Marymore is next, where you have to save Peach from her arranged marriage with Booster. But if you want, you can first pay a ridiculous 200 coins to sleep in the Marymore Hotel's Deluxe Suite, which comes with pretty much everything you'd expect from such a high price. A bellboy shows you to your room on the top floor, you get your own shower, and taking it makes Mario walk out with a red face. You get a nice soft bathrobe that's of course too small for you, and you can even order drinks via room service. Pretty cool. But here's the fun part. After actually staying the night in the suite, you can turn off the lights and go right back to sleep again, staying another full day and night, which you can do as many times as you want. If you then go downstairs, the owner is rightfully angry with you for staying longer than you paid for, and demands that you fork over an extra 100 coins for every extra night you spend in the room. But if you don't have the money, he will just straight up say, wait a minute, you're broke! Damn, bro! After this, he says he has no choice but to make you work at the hotel for the remaining amount, which features a long cutscene of you standing behind the reception desk for honestly way too long, while the owner takes care of all business, until a couple comes in that orders the deluxe suite, to which Mario then has to escort them to, which Mario seems a bit upset about halfway up the hotel. Eventually, you make it up there and Mario goes through the same regime as the Toad Bell hop from before, showing the tiny single bathrobe and where the shower is. Which, by the way, you can just go into it to take a shower while the couple is still in the room, and they just won't say anything about it, which is hilarious to me. After this, you talk to the owner again, who tells you to see some guests out coming down the stairs, and after that, your job is done, and the owner tells you to never stay longer than you pay forever again. Okay, actually continuing on with the story, after busting through the door of the wedding hall with Bowser, you all knock Peach away, which causes her to drop her shoes, ring, brooch, and crown. Ouch. The Snifters grab everything but the crown, and you're tasked with collecting it all from them and then grabbing the crown atop Booster's head as fast as possible, specifically before the candles in the room light up. After this, Peach goes in to kiss Mario for rescuing her, but Bowser gets mad that he's not getting a kiss, and Booster wants a kiss too. And depending on how many of the 8 candles were lit by the time you collected the crown and talked to Booster, you'll get a different scene. If 0 to 2 candles were lit, Peach kisses Mario as planned, which makes him blush beat red, while Bowser and Booster kiss each other on accident. Awesome. If 3 or 4 candles were lit, Peach runs away from Bowser who then kisses Mario, which he seems to enjoy? Okay, bro. If 5 or 6 candles were lit, you get practically the same scene, except Booster is the one to kiss Mario, and Bowser is just crying in the background. Mario again seems to be into it though. And finally, if 7 or all 8 candles were lit, you get the best possible ending, where Peach jumps off the podium as both Bowser and Booster kiss Mario on both cheeks, which Mario again seems to be into. Hell yeah! Sorry Peach, this wedding is for the boys. Oh, also, you can go downstairs in the building to see the chef tortoise working on the wedding cake, which you can jump onto, making them angry and throwing you off of it. You can also join in on a wedding group picture being taken, which is cute, but also kind of rude since Mario wasn't invited. At least I don't think he was. Maybe he's someone's plus one, I don't know. Anyways, a lot of stuff opens up after Marymore, so let's go through some facts pretty quickly since those last few all took a while to cover. First of all, Peach joins the party after this, and she's the only party member to join with a weapon already equipped, namely the Slap Glove, which raises her attack power from 40 to 80. Obviously nobody would ever unequip this, meaning most players will never see her attacking animation without any weapon equipped. Except me, because I was really curious. Here it is. Wow, amazing. Anyways, when you go back to the Mushroom Kingdom to drop Peach off in the castle, you can go into the inn and talk to this epic gamer toad a couple of times, who will then offer to sell you his game for 500 coins. Doing so will add a play game option to the pause menu, for which you get a really quick little introduction from another toad that just tells you that you can select it. In the original game, he actually also asked you to not cheat at the game by using a turbo type controller, but they removed that line in the remake, so I guess cheating is okay now. 
Now this game called Beatlemania is pretty cool and all, kind of just a standard high score based 2D top down shooter. But like I alluded to in the beginning, you can change the background of this game by switching around your party members. More specifically, it depends on who's in the second slot. For Mallow or Bowser, it'll be a grassy backdrop that heavily resembles the second level in Super Mario World. And for Gino or Peach, it'll be a green sky with some clouds seemingly not referencing anything specific. It's also definitely worth mentioning that in the remake, Beatlemania's graphics weren't updated at all, which is pretty fitting considering it's an actual video game in universe. But they did fill the empty screen space with a new Game Boy-like border, even including a power status light. Also in the remake, we can now see what console the Gamer Toad is playing on, since it was pretty much impossible to see in the original. And it appears to actually be a Game Boy, except with four face buttons, which not only doesn't exist in real life, but it's also ironic considering Beatlemania only uses one button for its gameplay. Something else you can do after Marymore is go back into Booster Tower to find Knife Guy, where if you win his Which Hand is the Yellow Ball in game 12 times in a row, he'll give you the Bright Card, which you'll need way later in the game to enter his brother's casino. But you can also go back to the Marymore Hotel and talk to this elderly toad who is willing to buy it from you for 100 coins. If you decline, he ups his offer to 5 frog coins, and if you decline again, he'll up it to 10 frog coins as his final offer. If you do sell it to him at any point, he'll offer to sell it back to you for 15 frog coins. This is the only bright card in the entire game, so this is just a terrible deal all around. Don't take it. But it is a pretty funny interaction. Also after Marymore, the couple that was originally to be married there but were kicked out by Booster will have been married and are spending their honeymoon at Yoster Isle. But more importantly, a baby Yoshi will also have hatched on the island, and you can feed him some cookies if you're riding on a Yoshi. And for those who already know about this baby, you know what's coming. If you give him 30 cookies in total, then leave and come back, he will have grown into an absolute unit. Yes, for those who didn't know, Super Mario RPG is where the big Yoshi meme comes from. Seeing him in HD now is quite amazing, I know. By the way, this Yoshi has a canonical name and it's Baby Fat, according to the official 47th issue of Nintendo Magazine System. Which is like, come on man, really? It wasn't born fat, it was my fault. Huh. And last thing you can do after Mary More, if you go back into the wedding hall, you can see a new Toad couple getting married there. And you can actually stand in front of the little podium to play an animation of Mario seemingly being the one to usher them in. At least I think that's what he's doing. Dang Mario, I didn't know you were registered for that. You can also talk to the toad behind the organ who will then play a little tune on it. Which is cool and all, but you can also jump on top of the organ to play a loud sound from it, scaring the couple getting married. Anyways, finally moving on with the story again, the next segment is Star Hill, where people's wishes take the form of little stars on the ground you can interact with to read their totally private and personal wishes. And fun fact, every single wish you can read here actually comes from a distinct character in the game, and some of them even change after you've done something specific for them. Let's go through them all. If I could just get that melody is from Todovsky, the musician toad in Tadpole Pond. The hunger, oh for some food, is from Balom, the boss that is constantly talking about being hungry and can even eat your party members the second time you fight him. I want to be the best treasure hunter in the world is from the treasure hunting toad in Moleville that can sell you some really rare stuff throughout the game. I hope I become famous is from Punchinello, the bomb maker extraordinaire boss that's obsessed with being well known for some reason. I wish I weren't such a crybaby is obviously from Mallow since he scolds you for reading his personal wish and then he comes out to say sorry instead of standing his ground because again, he's a crybaby. I want to be a world class baker, sorry for the terrible accent, is from Chef Torta in Marymore that talks with V's like that and is obviously a baker. Wish I could run faster in parentheses is from one of the Yoshis on Yoster Isle since they like racing and Yoshis talk in parentheses. As for which Yoshi made this wish specifically, it's probably the green one Mario can write, since that's the only one he can understand without needing a translator. And here are the last few wishes which have some more fun details about them. Wish I had some cricket jam comes from Mallow's grandfather, the Frog Sage, who Mallow was sent by to pick up a cricket pie at the start of the game, which you of course actually could get for him back then. Here's the interesting part, later in the game at Land's End, you can find a shortcut back to Kara Kara Sewers from the start of the game, and there you can access a treasure box that gives you some cricket jam. 
going back to the frog sage after this you can give him the cricket jam for which he thanks you and then he says my wish has come true because if you remember that's what he wished for he wished for cricket jam and if you go back to star hill after this the text on his wish has indeed changed now saying i wish for everyone to be happy what a nice guy and what a cool little detail Moving on, I want to help out my older brother Mario is obviously from Luigi, which is interesting for two reasons. First off, he's not really in this game. And second off, this wish was changed quite drastically from the original, where it instead said, I want to be a great plumber like my brother Mario. I don't understand why they felt like making this change. I mean, I know Nintendo doesn't really bring up Mario and Luigi being plumbers often, but it's not like they're removing that aspect about them. They were very obviously plumbers in the recently released Super Mario Bros. movie after all. I don't know, it's just kind of a weird change and I think I prefer the original. The new wish is just way too vague. Unless it's hinting at a Super Mario RPG sequel where Luigi is a party member. Oh my god, I figured it out. Uh, okay, let's just move on to more wishes. Can't wait to start a family and I hope my baby's cute come from Ross and Ronnie, the toad couple who got married and are having their honeymoon at Yoster Isle, which tells us that they're planning to have a baby soon. Cute. You can actually go into their house in the Mushroom Kingdom to find a note on their bed saying they're off to Star Hill to make a wish and that their wedding will be held at the village next to the hill, which was true since Marymore is next to Star Hill. This also implies that people need to go to Star Hill to make wishes, which is really weird considering the next wish I'm gonna talk about. And also because that means Luigi has been to Star Hill. Where the hell is he this game man? But yeah, the last wish I'm gonna talk about is a slight spoiler for the story. I mean, this is a really old game, but I'm sure plenty of you are playing it for the first time through this remake. So please skip to this timestamp if you don't want to be spoiled. There's your warning, 3, 2, 1. Okay, so the last wish is, please let Mallow find his way home. Which is obviously from Mallow's real parents, as confirmed by Mallow popping out and reacting to his parents' wish the way he does. The interesting part here is that later in the game when you've rescued King and Queen Nimbus and reunited them with their child Mallow, their wish has obviously come true, so if you go back to it in Star Hill, it will have changed to May Mallow fix the Star Way, since Mallow told them he's gonna continue to adventure with Mario to fix Star Road. We also know that it's Mallow's dad specifically that made the wish, because in the wish he called Star Road, Star Way, since that's what he thinks it's called when Mallow introduces Gino to him. That's a hilarious attention to detail. But yeah, like I said, it's weird that Ross and Ronnie's wish implies people have to go to Star Hill to make wishes, because that means Mallow's parents went down to the surface of the land to wish for their child to find his way home. Like, you could have just gone looking for him while you were down here. Mallow doesn't exactly look like anyone else in the Mushroom Kingdom, you know? Anyways, that's all the wishes. For now, at least. Because more will be added later in the game, which I'll be covering in a later video. You see, Star Hill is pretty much agreed upon to be the halfway point of this game, and I still have a ton more useless facts to go over. And because I don't want this video to be an hour long, I'm gonna save those for another time. So tune in then to see me cover those newly added wishes, that Peach exclusive item animation I mentioned at the start, and some cool new stuff related to the all new post game of the remake. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already to catch that video when it comes out, and don't forget about the bet we made. You have to like this video if you learned anything new from it. Big shoutouts as usual to The Flying Fire, The Game DD, LureFX1, Write the Yoshi, Quote is Cool, Kirk, Sil700, Sheen for the Win, Lime the Chef, Giant Firing Coal, Exobear, and the rest of my awesome Patreon supporters. Thanks for watching all the way to the end, and have a great rest of your day.